This is the sound. This is the sound. Yeah. 
Sings my soul. 
Come on, give them praise. Yes, how great thou art. How great thou art. I just want to speak the name of Jesus. Speak the name. Jesus from the mountains, Jesus in the streets, Jesus in the darkness over every enemy, Jesus for my family, I speak the holy name of Jesus. Oh. Thank you. 
I want all of you to listen extremely carefully right now. I want to thank this worship team. And uh, they, they are amazing. Are they amazing? I want to welcome everyone who's watching. Last night, nearly 30,000 people joined us in this tent crusade, and they're watching right now. Let's welcome them. Everybody who's watching, live streaming. Yep. And not only, not only in those of you that have been watching or follow the blog or go to our website, mariomarillo.org, you'll know that people have been healed watching this crusade. A woman left a comment at the blog this morning that she had extreme pain in her feet poor circulation and discoloration in both her feet. She was joining in with us when the anointing was flowing. This morning she woke up, her, both of her feet are natural color, there's no pain, she's totally healed. And so, how many of you understand, I was not exaggerating when I said if you're watching, you can receive a miracle right where you're watching. But I'm gonna, I'm gonna take it even to another level, may I? If you're, there are people that in the name of Jesus are not planning on seeing this, not even Christian, don't even want God. They may be in a hotel room about to kill themselves and they're gonna be supernaturally taken to this live stream. And God is gonna save them. How many of you believe God is going to save souls? Everywhere. Thank you, Jesus. And finally, before I have you seated, I want all of you to look up Destiny Music. 
this this worship team has just released a new album. Come on, shout to the Lord. They just released an album. And it's on it's on all the music platforms. Just look up Destiny Music and you'll see it's let the church say amen. Well, and that's the name of the album is let the church say amen get their music and as and i'm gonna release them to go to their seats except ralph but didn't they do wonderful clap as they go clap thank them Don't leave your seat because we are we are absolutely packed tonight. This is a wonderful, wonderful turnout on a Thursday night. Now, can I say to you something, a strange email that I got today? Well, a strange comment. They said, why do you need drums and guitar? Why aren't you singing the old hymns? And I thought to themselves, we have. How many of you noticed? We're singing the hymns and the new music, both. But people are wonderful, aren't they? So I want to remind that person who I'm sure is watching right now. A mighty fortress is our God, is a classic Lutheran hymn that began as a song that was sung in the pubs in Germany. It was a beer song. And uh, he, Martin Luther took it and added the lyrics. Every generation has its legalism about music. You know what I believe? I believe there's good music and there's bad music. And there's some people that have, when they sing, they have a beautiful voice and others make a joyful noise. <laughs> But the key is the message. The words to the song are what matter. So I want you to go to Destiny Music, and I want you to buy their album online. Now, the day of bringing CDs to an event is over. You can't even get a CD player in your car anymore. It's kind of like back in the day when you used to, you know, if you have to, Bend the license plate down to put gas in your car. It's time to let it go. If you push a button and a red needle jumps over, it's time to let it go. How many of you are happy tonight? Well, I am. I have some very exciting news but I can't waste it on a quiet crowd. I mean, if you're gonna be like that. <laughs> oh, I love that. I tell you. Jesus, yes. Well, let me make my announcement and then you can go wild, okay? We've only received one offering in this entire crusade. And the gifts that came in, both in this offering and through other sources, this crusade is paid off in one offering. Somebody give God the glory. And you know what that means? It means that we get to do something glorious that rarely ever gets done in a crusade. Our next crusade is in Bakersfield. I want to mention my friend, Manuel Carrizales, who leads Stay Focused Ministries in Bakersfield. Bakersfield is under siege, ladies and gentlemen. It has become the dropping off point for the gangs that are coming in here illegally through our southern border, and my friend, Manuel Carrizales, a year ago, 
every week did a funeral, 52 in a row every week for a young man shot and killed in a drive-by shooting in Bakersfield. Well, we're done with that. Four nights, we're taking our tent and we're gonna wade into the gangland partnering with Stay Focused Ministries, Inner City Action, others, and we're gonna win souls in Bakersfield, California. Yeah, we are. Everybody say January 8, 9, 10, and 11. Sunday through Wednesday. Now we're gonna be on the campus of Canyon Hills Church and they already have a tent set up that is bigger than this one. We don't even have to put ours up. I'm kind of jealous of their tent because it is high class. Ours is very high class in my opinion and uh, but you wait till our next one. Our next tent will be larger than a football field. Man, I'm getting excited, are you? How many, how many of you believe we're starting a movement in California? Yeah, we are, we really are. God waited for me to get to this season of my life where I don't give a rip what anybody thinks. Now, let me tell you something. You know, the word rip sounded more obscene than it was. It's R-I-P. So if it made you mad, I just want you to rest in peace. So I pity the young people because you still care about how you look and what people think about you. And somebody said, Mara, I don't like you. I go, ooh. You know? When the London Times accused Benjamin Franklin, who was beloved in London in 1776, they wrote an article and accused him of being the ringleader of the American Revolution, as if it were an insult. He said, it is a speck of dirt on my pants and he dusted it off. You know, we've got to get to the point where we're not afraid of being persecuted. We know that Jesus said we'll be hated. But you know what the goal is? Is let us be hated for the right reason. Not for church hypocrisy. Not for a bad witness of immorality or greed or materialism. Let it be because we're a shining light. In a dark time, how many of you want to be that? Wave your hand at me now. Here we go. We're going to raise an offering now that will go in its entirety. And here's what I'm going to tell you is going to end up happening in all our crusades. We're going to end up on the final night with the debts all paid and the, that offering going to the next one. And it's going to snowball until we'll be able to do crusades where people cannot afford to have us come. And we're just gonna pay for it ourselves. But I want all of you to say it with me. Los Angeles. I maybe believe LA needs a miracle. You know, the Lord, Paul the apostle knew he had to go to Rome. And he told Agrippa, God did not do these things in a corner. We have got to bring the gospel to the cultural mountains of influence. And we're going to Los Angeles, to the Los Angeles fairgrounds. Yes, we are. Uh, in September 9, 10, 11, and 12, we'll be there on 9-11. And I'm going to tell you, it's going to be a, an incredible miracle. And I'm going to make all of you go to it because it will be in our new tent. Now, we're gonna receive this offering real fast. There are two offerings that are absolutely wrong. The one where you're ashamed to ask. If you're embarrassed to ask, you shouldn't ask. You should never receive an offering if you don't believe in what you're raising money for. You should be excited 
and feel honored to be a part of what God is doing in the earth. The only way your money becomes permanent, the Bible says, lay not treasure for yourself on earth, but in heaven. A.W. Tozer said, whatever is given to Christ becomes eternal. You can never, ever stop thanking God for a soul that gets saved through your giving. We've labored and fought with all of our might to keep our ministry lean. The, our money doesn't go into any slush fund or any anything on the side. What comes in goes out. That's why the Lord's blessing us. So I'd like you to be a part of telling Bakersfield, the hungry, the lost, the homeless, the addicted, the gangbanger, send us in there. Help us. Volunteer to be a part of it. You'll see on mariomarillo.org starting tomorrow a link to be a part of the Bakersfield miracle. Some people are actually going to give up their holidays to be down there. And many of you know that we're leaving here tomorrow. This tent gets packed up on a semi truck, three of them that were donated by RNL Trucking, and it's going to Fort Myers, Florida, where Lance and I are going to be in the middle of where the people are that were victims of Hurricane Ian. It's going to be an amazing move of God. Everybody say Bakersfield. Bakersfield. We'll have a miracle. Bakersfield shall be saved. Yeah, it will. It's on the 99, folks. It's my assignment. The check is made out to MMM which stands for Miracles, Miracles, Miracles. If you want to give online, we had a little glitch with our texting. So we got a QR code that you'll see on the screen. And all of you that are high tech, you'll see it over here. Is it on both or one? It's on both. It's in stereo. Now, here's what that does. It takes you to step one which is to fill out a very simple form. A lot of people will download that and not fill out the form. You're not giving an offering just because you have the code. Fill out the form very quickly, donate, if that's how you'd like to do it. The rest of you are giving cash, and I'm gonna announce this again. I don't like the 501c3 classification. I don't like it. So our board is moving to get out of that slavery. Are you, you hearing what I'm saying? The government cannot tell me what I'm not saying. They can't. I'm going to ask you how many of you would still give to our ministry if there was no tax deduction at all for it. Man, leftist devils manifest right now. They assume that you are so lukewarm that unless you get something back, you won't give. But it's time to put that devil in his place. We are got to be, we got to go back to being free Americans. We've got to do it, man. I'm getting worked up here. I'm going to stop. The white envelope allows us to record your gift if you're giving cash. And it allows us to, allows you as well to use your credit card if you want to give that way. And that's all we have to say, except raise your hand. If you'd like one of these white envelopes, raise your hand. And we give them to you. And I'm going to keep talking while, as I asked last night, how many of you can give and listen at the same time? The real Jesus is what we need. I'm going to say it again and get amen. Amen. I know you're busy, but those of you that can hear me, go ahead and say amen. The real Jesus is what we need. Not the plastic Jesus. Not the political Jesus. Not the denominational Jesus. Not the seasonal Jesus. How many of you understand that Christ didn't stay in the manger? He grew up and became the Lion of Judah. And he, he faced down injustice and evil. We're going to talk about him in just a moment. I want to thank all of you for giving, by the way. The greatest crusade we have done right here. And you have no idea 
what it would take for me to say that. Because our crusade in Hanford was absolutely epic and historic. Then when we moved to Colorado Springs and we did our crusade there, the people from Radiant Church, Todd and Kelly Hudnall, who I hope are watching and I want to say hello to them, they marshaled an army of volunteers. But the miracles, the atmosphere, have we had an atmosphere in this tent the last four and how many of you just got to admit, it's been amazing. It's been amazing. I know you're, you're preparing to give. Some of you are blinking at me like that. I'll take that. I'll take that. It looks like a turn signal, but I'll take it. What's wrong with this man saying things like that? I want to give you a moment more, but I want the workers. Do not uh, pass the buckets yet. Don't pass them yet. I'd like you to take your positions, if you will. Those of you that are going to receive the offering. Thank you. How many of you need a moment more to get your gift ready? Raise your hand, do you? All right. You're not giving to a man. You're giving to Christ. And you're giving to the cause of the kingdom of God. And someone said, well, God doesn't need my money. Well, let me tell you something about that. God is privileged that through man, the gospel will be preached. And to think that God has permitted us to partner with him in this is an astonishing thing. He could have sent angels to preach the gospel. But he said, since by man came death, through man came also the resurrection from the dead. And Jesus said this, as my father has sent me, so send I you. And that's what you're doing. You're saying, Mario, go get them. You're saying, Mario, keep this thing flowing and don't let up and don't stop. And we won't. Father in heaven, I thank you that you alone are worthy of all that we receive right now. No one else in Jesus name. Amen. Go ahead. I love the atmosphere of a tent. Don't you? Raise your hand if you love it. There's no other atmosphere like it. And behind me is Brother Ralph. As you know, I keep referring to Brother Ralph. He and I have the same DNA. We came out of a storefront church. And you know, in a storefront church, we don't care. We came to praise the Lord. And the other night I loved it because some of you broke a sweat in church for the first time in 30 years. Actually broke a sweat, worshiping God and moving your feet and getting excited. Now look at me. A lot of people believe that that kind of mannerism is offensive to the outsider. And yet perennially, Black gospel has been one of the most popular musical forms in the world and continues to be. Because when that anointing comes on a camp meeting song, I'm standing here waiting on, I'm wondering if there's a Pentecostal in this room somewhere. When that camp meeting spirit comes on you, whether it is country or whether it is gospel, it's just you're never the same. And I've been infected. I've been infected with the joy of the Lord. Sometimes I get in my feet. And we sit there, we think, well, if we ever really let it go, and I'm not about to let you yet, but if we ever really let it go, Mario, the outsider will be offended. Are you kidding me? It'll get the demons off their back. It'll straighten up their mind. And they'll come running to God. Clap real loud for the Lord Jesus Christ. <laughs> the hardest sermon of the week is the last one. That's the one you pray over the most. It is also true that the last letter that Paul wrote, he wrote to a spiritual son. 
It was the most emotional letter that Paul ever wrote. I feel very emotional. And I want all of you that are here to know that the people of God in the Roseville area have done their job. You've done your job. You know how I know? Because once again, I've got that delightful stare coming out of the eyes of people that have that look that says I was kidnapped and dragged here by my friend. And you're all over the place. And I want you to relax because I'm going to talk to you. One day a woman said, you don't understand me. How many of you know some people have said that? You do not understand me. I'm going to give you a biological fact. You're made up of over 3 billion traits. IBM doesn't understand you. A supercomputer does not understand you. And the fact of the matter is, you don't understand yourself. You say, Mara, of course I understand myself. No, you don't. One day, a man, an intellectual, asked me a question. He said, I want you to define sin for me. Because he felt real modern. He thought, there is no modern definition for sin. How many of you like to know what I told him? Raise your hand if you'd like to know what I, my definition of sin. At the worst possible moment, when everything is going right, and you are loved, you are accepted, you're successful, you will do the stupidest thing you have ever done. What is that about the human spirit that does that? Why did you wreck your marriage? Why did you, after years of not drinking or being alcoholic, suddenly one night revert back? Why did you take a bribe when you knew everything inside of you told you that's crazy? Don't do it. Now I'm going to tell you that there is something in our nature. There's a disease in mankind. The Bible teaches us that we're separated from God. And that separation, that detachment, is why we will go in a cycle of failure and disappointment. And even when we're up, we'll feel down. Even when we're at the top of the pile, we'll feel at the bottom. And we'll hurt people we should never hurt. And we'll lie when we don't have to lie. And that, my friend, is sin, doing the stupidest thing at the worst possible time when you don't have to do it. Now I'm gonna begin and tell you that one day all of history was split. There was a before and an after, and I'm gonna tell you when it was. It was the day that Jesus announced to the public who he was and why he had come. It was an amazing day. And when I read this, in Luke 4, 17, he was handed the book of the prophet Isaiah. And when he had opened the book, he found the place where it is written, the spirit of the Lord is upon me because he's anointed me to preach the gospel to the poor. He has sent me to heal the brokenhearted to proclaim liberty to the captive, the recovery of sight to the blind, to set at liberty those who are oppressed, to proclaim the acceptable year of the Lord. Then he closed the book. Everybody look at me. This is the moment. This is the moment. Look at me. This is the moment. It's all right to read that. But those words turned into a nuclear warhead in a moment when he added a phrase. He said, today, this prophecy is fulfilled in all of your eyes. Now look, 
there's a moment. There is a moment when the promises of God are no longer something we're looking forward to in the future. God has times. God has seasons. There are people that say America is finished. There are people that have pronounced doom, destruction, and death on us. There are people that believe we will deliberately dismantle every American institution so that we can rebuild it into something that doesn't have God, does not have Christianity, does not have it. The problem is you can defeat conservatives. You can defeat politicians. You can defeat religious people, but you cannot defeat God. You cannot defeat God. Like it or not, believe it or not, accept it or not, the hand of God is on the United States of America. I need some help right now. Am I preaching? Yeah. Then he closed the book and gave it back to the attendant and sat down. And all the eyes of the people were on him like, what is he going to do next? You see, they'd already heard of the miracles. By this time, by Luke 4, Capernaum had almost had disease wiped out from him. Nearby, their neighbors, they heard the story. News didn't travel like it does now. Nobody could text each other. But Capernaum, which had been written off, whose children were denied the education that other children could get, they weren't even really allowed to worship in Jerusalem anymore because of the division of the two tribes and the other ten. But Isaiah said it was coming. He said the people that walked in darkness have seen a great light. They that dwelt in the land of the shadow of death, upon them as the light shined. Now look, the northern tribes were deprived. Capernaum was the ground zero for being left out of everything. And Jesus went there first. He went to the lowest, the people that were most forgotten. Let me tell you something. When he stood there, it was in Capernaum that they tore the roof off of it and lowered the man and he was healed. It was in Capernaum that by the sea, he healed thousands and thousands of people. Now he went home to his hometown picked up the book and said, you know what I'm doing? I'm formally announcing to my family who I am. I'm not an illegitimate child. I'm not just the son of a carpenter. I am the anointed Messiah and son of God. Somebody help me right here. I'm preaching now. Today, Verse 21, this scripture is fulfilled in your hearing. Of all the things that I must accomplish this week, the fear that is on me is that I will answer for God for every word that I preach, especially so close to Sacramento, where we are near what I consider to be the mountain of influence of political power in the state of California. This is where the miracle needs to start, is right there. This is where the transformation needs to come. This is where we deliver our children from perverted education. Right now. It is important for all of you in this room to know why Jesus came. He said, the spirit of the Lord is upon me because I have come to do these things. And he rattled off his list. The next thing that I want to say is that no one has been lied about more in human history than Jesus. There are more lies been told about him than anyone else. 
You can say Alexander the Great. You can name any world legendary historical figure. No one has been subjected to the lies that Christ has. And the most consistent generational evil that we commit is we hijack Christ to our own social movement. He doesn't belong to you. He belongs to God. His ideas don't belong to man. They belong, belong to God. And it's clear that when Christ came, you don't get to decide who he is. You don't get to decide what he's about. The LGBTQ community has hijacked Christ and said he would be tolerant and open-minded and he would accept everyone no matter what. You don't know what he said. He said he in the beginning made them male and female. Now look, he said it, I didn't say it. You can know without a doubt where Christ stands when he said, suffer the little children to come unto me for of such is the kingdom of God. No matter how you look at it, that's what he would say about a fetus, about a human person. You can't decide to tell Jesus what he believes. Let me tell you something. It's time that we speak up and stop letting the left hijack the words of Jesus Christ. I'm telling you, Gavin Newsom is saying the most self-canceling term I've ever heard. He said, I'm going to make California a sanctuary for abortion. Now, wait a minute. How self-canceling is that? It makes as much sense. It's as logical a statement as saying, I'm going to put a screen door on a submarine. Sanctuary is when you protect life, not take it. And so he bought billboards across the United States, welcoming people to California to come and abort their child. And he put a verse of scripture on there quoting Christ that says, love your neighbor as yourself. Well, mom, I'm gonna tell you, the neighbor is the person that lives closest to you, right? So when you have a child in the womb, that's your neighbor. Come on, somebody. And it says to love your neighbor as yourself. So, Brother Gavin, you don't get to interpret Jesus Christ. You let him speak for himself. The Bible said he'd be the most lied about. He lied about Jesus. <laughs> yeah. We need the Americans that live in California to have their eyes open once and for all. Now, let me, let me look at you. You don't get to decide what Jesus taught. You only get to read it and believe it. You don't have a private opinion on the matter. You don't hijack it for your group. You don't steal it for your movement. Because once you violate what he said, you're a liar and a fraud. Now... The Bible says this, you don't have the right. He said, do you think that I've come to establish unity? I have not come to establish unity, but to bring a sword. And, and you say Jesus is divisive. Thank God that Christ is divisive. Look at me. He divides you from crystal meth. He divides you from suicide. He divides you from hatred and death and fear. I'm glad he divided. I'm glad the sword of the Lord came down and broke the chain that held my soul to the devil. 
Somebody help me love Jesus a little bit right now. Jesus is not a salad bar where you pick this. This is what I want on my plate, but I don't want this part. You either take what he says at face value, accept everything he taught, unlimited, total, contextually correct. You accept what Christ said or you're lying to yourself. I had a lady say there are many ways to God. And if I'm sincere, I'll find the truth. I said, okay, try this. You're sick and you need medicine. Blindfold yourself. Open the medicine cabinet. And when you've got perfect, sincere feelings, you should be able to open any bottle you want and the pill will work. Truth from Christ cannot be compromised. No, no, no. You cannot lie about our Jesus anymore. You can't have him. He's not yours. I don't like the idea of hell. You don't have a choice. A man said to me, a loving God would never put anyone in hell. And I looked at him the way a raccoon stares at truck headlights. I said, you know the sin you just committed? The Bible calls it idolatry. Because it says they made God in their own image. God is an eternal being. I'm looking right in this camera because God just told me somebody's watching that needs to hear this part. God is an eternal being. He doesn't think like you. He doesn't feel like you. What you're saying is if I were God, I wouldn't like there to be hell. But you're not God. And so I love you, Jesus, because you said love your neighbor and do unto others as you would have them do unto me. But when Christ mentions hell, I can't accept that. You can't have one without the other. Now, he said this, I will deliver you. He's a deliverer. How many of you believe Christ is a deliverer? Let's, how many of you believe Christ is a deliverer? Matthew 12 says, all manner of evil spoken against the Son of Man will be forgiven. But against the Holy Spirit, it will not be forgiven. Christ came and explained, I'm here to destroy the works of evil. Now I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to go after modern religion for a minute. Give me a break. If you believe in the Jesus that allows people to have coffee, overhead projectors, big screen, skinny jeans, and fog machines, but you don't preach repentance, help me somebody. And you don't tell them about the blood that was shed on the cross. And you say, I don't want to offend the outsider. And you hand somebody a cup of coffee when they walk into church with a look in your face that said, Babe, you better drink this if you want to live and be awake for the whole deal. But I want you to understand this. We serve a fiery God, an awesome God, a glorious God. He is holy. How many of you believe we need to have a holiness? He said, this is why I came. I came to set at liberty, to recover, to proclaim, to liberate, to set free. And here's how it reads in 1 John 3, 8. The disciple John wrote this about Jesus. He who sins is of the devil. For the devil has sinned from the beginning. For this purpose, the Son of God was manifested that he might destroy the works of the devil. One day I was watching TV and the preacher who had a, a grin, a big smiley face preacher telling the people, Jesus went about doing good. I want to quote it, Acts 10, 38. Jesus went about doing good, healing all who were oppressed of the devil, for God is with him. I want you, the atheist, to look at me. 
Last night, we heard a miracle of a woman's body was standing right here on a recently broken ankle, dancing like she was going for a prize. She had that broken ankle create a blood clot that went up her leg to her heart, lungs, and her brain. She got mysterious pain in her shoulder. The doctor told her in the month of June that she had almost died three times in her life. And you sat here and you knew I didn't know her. And I began to describe what was going on in her shoulder to the glory of God. I began to talk about how she had almost died three times. And I told her about her leg, her heart, her lungs, and her brain. And you saw her standing here, not healed by a man, not healed by Mario, but healed by the son of the living God, Jesus Christ. You know, I'm gonna say it, I'm gonna say get some help. This is real. This is real. The church is not supposed to be without miracles. Listen to me. You, sir, you mega church pastor, watch out. You may be a brilliant stand-up comedian, but the devil does not respect entertainment. He only respects the anointing. He's not afraid of your education. He's not afraid of your reputation. He's not afraid of how many watch you on YouTube. He doesn't care about what you can say and how you can move an audience. The only thing the devil fears is what Jesus stood up and said, I have been filled with the Holy Spirit and I'm anointed to destroy the works of the devil. Sit. So he said this on TV, this particular pastor. And by the way, there are very, very many anointed mega church pastors that are true men and women of God that are serving God and preaching the truth at great cost. Not every church that preaches the truth can say that they can stay small. You can't. The problem is when you tell the truth in love, you're anointed of God. It, Jesus will show up at church. And when Jesus shows up, there's always a crowd because humanity will beat a path to go anywhere where Jesus is. Somebody said, how are you filling this tent? Because I've invited Christ into it. And he said, yes, I'll come in your tent and I'll make the lame walk and the blind see and the deaf hear. And I'll instantly deliver the, I'm gonna run around this room in a second, I'm getting. But we have imprisoned the body of Christ in meaningless rituals where one day a week we act like animals in a zoo and the zookeeper feeds us. And as long as we condone to stay in our cages and be absolutely malleable and tame, we'll have church. And on our wake, we lost a nation. We should have been the dangerous Christian. We should have been the anointed Christian. We should have been the mouthy one, the kind that says, oh no, you're not gonna tell my child that. Oh no, you're not gonna write that law. Oh no, you're not gonna be, you're not gonna have it. No, we became passive. Am I preaching? We became, a, I don't want anyone to think I'm unloving. There is no worse hatred in the world than to prevent someone from knowing the truth because you're afraid of what it will mean to you and cost you. If you're afraid of losing members, you hate your people. If you're afraid of telling what the Bible teaches, you hate your people. So he said, he quoted the first half of a verse, the greatest lie is a half truth. He said, Jesus went about doing good, and then he stopped, and he looked at the crowd. He said, that's what I want. I want a congregation that does good. 
I want you to go and mow the lawn of an elderly person that's shut in. Bake them a pie. Give someone a smile. Let someone in your lane, which is almost impossible in California. <laughs> and so you're sitting there, and how can I question that? How can I look at that and say that's not right? Because in the light of who Jesus is, I'm preaching tonight that we are no longer going to let people hijack Jesus Christ. Because Jesus never said that. Here's what the book of Acts said. He went about doing good. Destroying the works of the devil. Healing all who were oppressed of Satan. For God was with him. How's this? instead of baking a pie, get somebody to stand up out of a wheelchair in the name of Jesus. Get a prostitute delivered of a devil. Watch God open a blind eye, heal a camp. I need to preach a little bit more. I maybe would rather do that. Instead of mowing a lawn, how about we mow down the works of darkness? Follow what 2 Corinthians 10, 4 says. Casting down every vain imagination. For the weapons of all warfare are not carnal. They're not social. They're not a fad. But they are mighty through God to destroy what is suffocating America right now. Glory to Jesus. You don't get to leave out the parts that America needs to know. That to become a Christian means this. Your sadness evaporates. Your fear vaporizes. Your bondage is instantly over. You, Let me tell you, people say, well, we need to explain Christianity to people. You know what we're going to do? We're going to do just the opposite because the peace he gives has his understanding. And the joy is unspeakable and full of glory. You wonder why did we grow so fast in the Jesus movement? People don't understand this when I say it. They don't understand what I'm saying. I said it's because we did not know how to witness. And we had two problems in the Jesus movement. Number one, we didn't know how to witness. And number two is we didn't know when to stop witnessing. We were, we're like, like, dude, you don't make any sense, but there's so much joy on you. There's so much life. I knew you before. See, we, in the Jesus movement, we had friends that knew us before. And man, when you, when I knew you before, you were strung out dead. Your eyes were dead. Your spirit's dead. Now I look at you and you're alive. You're alive. What happened to you? Man, I don't know how to explain it, but you need some of this. You need Jesus. You need the joy. Yeah. We're saying it now. I don't know how many times in the Jesus movement someone would say to me, a classmate, a friend, an enemy, I don't know what you got, but I've got to have it. My mama today, uh, thanks to having lunch with Pastor Greg and Kathy, I was treated to a chili relleno made by a Mexicano lady, a Mexicana I had tears in my eyes, man. <laughs> you know, I live in Tennessee and they, they're, they're still, it's a, it's a work in progress to make Mexican food. 
they put white cheese on everything and they think that's what we want. So foamy white cheese, by the way. When, when I bit into that, when I bit into that today, and I had a thousand memories. You know what the Bible says in closing? Because watch. Why do you spend your money on that which is not? Come to the waters, drink freely. Buy bread without money and meat without money. I'm going to tell you the biggest lie that we've ever told about the Christian faith in California. I've studied Hinduism, Buddhism. I can keep up with the people that know these esoteric religions. I studied them. I know what they're saying. Nobody is going to walk up to me with that palaver of the mystical levels, the pantheon, the, the Tibetan book of the dead, the levels of enlightenment, nirvana. Forget it. It's not going to work on me. For me, it goes over like a pregnant pole vaulter. because I have tasted Jesus. Help me somebody. So the Bible says, ho everyone that thirsts, come and drink and buy bread without money. Why do you spend your money on that which is not? The moment has arrived where everyone in this room has a choice. And there are two of you in this room that are in the most danger. And then there are two others of you that are in such a great place that words cannot describe it. The two that are in danger are those that practice saying, I am not going to serve Christ. It's beneath my intellectual prowess to entertain the idea that Christ is divine and this is the word of God. I'm going to tell you what's wrong. In order to maintain that, people always say, oh, the Christians are such fools because they're taking such a vast step of leap of faith. No one is exercising faith like the atheists. Nobody because they're taking a universe that we keep upgrading how big it is. We don't know how big it is. Last time we checked, someone said 55 billion light years across. Try to imagine how long it would take light to travel 55 billion years at 182,000 miles per hour. And the atheist said, in all of that expanse, there's no God. You've been to all of it. That's why Chesterton said the atheist is like someone that has painted the inside of a cardboard box black and painted stars and said, this is the universe. You don't know. You don't know. And quit saying you do. You're convincing yourself. Here's what happens in the modern mind. We believe a philosophy and it doesn't work. So we immediately move to the next level to something else, to be distracted from it. The relationship blows up. We go, it was their fault. It was their problem. It was there. There's some self-analysis, but never true honesty. And you're the victim. Nobody else. Second person that's in danger is the miserable Christian. The miserable Christian. Boy, you talk about a paradox. You talk about a self-canceling phrase. The other day, somebody described to me a coffee drink that is a decaf latte made with skim milk. And when you order that, they call it a why bother.
And we have why bother churches. We don't talk about sin and therefore we don't have victory. We don't talk about repentance. Therefore, the active ingredient of conversion never kicks in. So we have people that have gone to church that have, are re listening to such a dumbed down, deluded, ineffective version of Christ that they wonder, why did you bother? Why do you bother listening to someone who's actually saying nothing? It's better for you to sit under a cranky, annoying individual like me because you know for a fact that I'm telling you the truth of God. Somebody said amen. Now, close your eyes, everyone. <coughs> The Bible said that in the last days there would be fake Christians. There's a lot of things said in the Bible about fake Christians. It said they'd have a form of godliness but deny the power of it. The Bible says that in the last days there would be people that would be ever learning and educating themselves but never come to the knowledge of the truth. I know that I offended people in this room I know I offended people that are watching on live stream, but I know for a fact that if you could just humble yourself, the best thing that you could ever imagine could happen to you. The best thing that ever happened to you. The worst thing that could happen to you is to drive in a car in Chicago using a map of downtown Los Angeles. None of the streets are the right name. None of it works. That's exactly what you're doing. You're using a map to live by that is not God's word. And that map has all the wrong street names, all the wrong results, and you're paying the price. Let me tell you what pride says. I know what I'm doing doesn't work, but I'd rather suffer than to just admit I'm wrong and find peace. It's not worth it. So in a moment, I'm going to ask you to raise your hand across this audience. If you'll say, I am tired of having a weak faith. I can't stand up to the culture. I got to tell you, Mario, I fold up in the presence of an angry leftist, I fold up because my Christianity is not deep enough to withstand their assault. But if you had the real Jesus, you would stand against the culture. You would stand against the tide. You would be that house built on the rock that when the winds of lies and perversion come, your house will stand. Today is the day for you to have a new life a new heart, a new mind, and peace and forgiveness in your soul. Christ wants to forgive you right now. He wants to change you. He wants to transform you. Now, listen very carefully. Don't miss this. How do I know that I need to raise my hand? How do I know it? This is where modern preaching has failed you because it doesn't identify the crisis and the tragedy. You have fear, you have anger, you have confusion, you have heaviness of heart and spirit. You don't know what your future holds. You say, Mara, you're taking a long time to say all this. As I told you last night, I have a right to a long altar call because Peter said, Bible says in Acts 2, that Peter, with many other words, he spoke and compelled them, saying, save yourself from this doomed generation. The things that you are relying on are going to be destroyed. The foundation you are living on is quicksand. The ideas that you feel are noble are a counterfeit to the real light 
And Jesus said, take heed that the light that is in you be not darkness. So rather than examining yourself and saying, well, I'm not that bad a person. I don't do those many things wrong. Don't look at that. Look at this. Why does my life hurt? Why do I feel such moments of emptiness? Why am I continually dreading the future? Because I don't know what's going to happen to me. It's because even though you've gone to church and even though you've confessed and believed in the Bible and in Christ, you never got the genuine article, the miracle, the transformation. Now's your chance. Mario, will you pray for me that today my fear, my depression, my confusion, my anxiety, how we sang it tonight, I just want to speak the name of Jesus over everything. That's what I'm doing. It's not a song. It's not just a song. It's an act. Man telling you, look, haven't you heard enough? Haven't you been in pain long enough to understand that God wants to give you something more than you ever imagined? And he wants to do it now but you've got to let me pray for you. Mario Murillo, pray for me. I want the real Jesus, the real peace, the real new life, and I want it now. Let me see your hand. Raise it wherever you are. Raise it wherever you are. Raise it right now. Listen, if you're afraid of raising your hand, hands have gone up in every part of this tent. If you raise your hand right now, you're not gonna be by yourself. You're going to be part of a great group that is leaving prison for new life. Put your hand in the air. If you didn't already and you need this, get your hand up. Now, everyone with your hand raised, stand to your feet. Stand up wherever you are. Stand up. Stand up. Stand up. Stand up. Stand up. If you need this, the real Jesus, stand up. Now, all of you that are on your feet, find the nearest aisle and come to Christ right now. Come, all of you that are standing, come right now. Fill in right here over the middle, every one of you. Fill in and come right now. Look at this. Come on, you better clap, church. This is amazing. Amazing. Keep coming. Keep coming. <laughs> I never ever get over the thrill of new lives. You're beginning a wonderful journey. You've taken the best the wisest move you've ever made in your life. Keep coming right now. Keep coming. I wanted to apologize to those of you that were coming to Jesus while other people were walking out. Because I don't know of anything more embarrassing unless there's a legitimate reason for you to literally bump into somebody who's trying to come to God while you're walking to your car. So whatever it is, stop it. Because two more minutes can't possibly make that much difference. And God help you. Now, put your hand over your heart.
You have no idea how long God has waited for this opportunity to give you happiness and to defeat your enemy and to give you the power to untangle all of the crisis of your life. This is when a new you, a better you, a powerful you will face the issues of your life. Say these words with me. And if I'm going slow, it's because they're being translated. Say, Jesus, I know that I found you just in time. And I know how much I need you to save my life. Take my life, save it from the power of the devil. Let my life be the life of Jesus, full of joy, peace. Cleanse me by the power of your blood that washes away all my sin and makes me a new person. Thank you, Jesus, for coming into my heart. I know that you died for me. I know that on the third day, you rose again. I'm yours. I'm saved. I'm transformed. In the mighty name of Jesus. Amen. Now look at me. <laughs> Just in time. How many of you here, how many of you here are ready for the power of God to start guiding your life? Are you? Are you? Well, here's how we want to help you. We have the best Christians in the world waiting just outside the tent to have a short conversation with you for maybe five minutes. They're going to get a basic amount of information from you, and I'm going to tell you why, so you're not freaking out. You're not going to get flooded with spam or a bunch of financial appeals in the mail. We just want you to let us pray for you and be available to you to strengthen your faith in Christ. Listen, Gloria a Dios. Gloria a Dios. This is conversion right here. This is the power of God, brother. Amen. All right, look at me. We're going to leave her at the altar. We're going to, she's getting through to God. She's good. She's fine right where she is. I want, let's open the Red Sea again. Stand on one side and the other. Those of you on this side, get ready at my signal to start marching down there. You'll be out there five minutes. Nobody's going to leave without you. And you're going to be back in the meeting before you know it. Those of you here, turn around and face there and get ready to go. And what we're going to do is I want you to turn around because I want the audience to see how handsome and beautiful you are. <laughs> so wait. Hold it. Hold your applause. Start marching down the aisle. Start marching, all of you. Now, welcome your new brothers, sisters in to the family of Jesus Christ. Glory a Dios.
Put your hands in the air. Repeat this after me. We have no right to be this happy. Our eyes have seen the most wonderful thing we could ever imagine. Thank you, Lord, for saving the lost. Put your hands down and look at me. You realize that out there are the wives, the husbands, the sons, the daughters, the moms and dads, maybe grandparents, but families are being unified under the Christian faith. It's a miracle. There's so much love in this room, so much love. And as all those hundreds of people that were saved went out and this building still looks like it's full. And there are counselors out there with them, an equal number. How many of you feel the Lord's power? Yeah. You may be seated. So one day I was at the Bethel School of Supernatural Ministry when a young man walked up to me and I'm holding a clipboard and he goes, give me your mantle. So I hit him in the head with my clipboard and I said, go get your own. I'm not half done with this mantle yet. How many of you are not half done yet? Come on, somebody. You know, I heard a vicious rumor that somebody told you you were old. You know, if your children try to put you in a rest home, fold up your walker and hit them with it. And tell them, I'm staying in my house, I'm staying in my room. And my brain ain't going to go the way of other politicians I know. I can't believe he said that. How many of you feel like God can restore your youth? You know, one of the things I'm here to do, because the glory of God is filling this, this place. One time in the Bible... The prophet Haggai said, the glory of this latter house will be greater than the former. He's saying there's going to be a greater glory than the multi-billion dollar building that Solomon built, which was astonishing. How could the glory of any building be greater than that? Well, it happened one day in Jerusalem when Jesus at the age of 12 walked into the temple. And when he walked into the temple, it was fulfilled what Haggai said. The glory of the latter house was greater than the, other, the former. Because how many people know wherever Jesus walks in, there's the glory. Man, I worked on that. I thought I was going to get thunderous applause, a gentle spring rain. Come on, <laughs> Put your hands in the air. When I came to Roseville, the Lord said, I'm going to shift the church. While you're there, there's going to be a shift. They're going to shift back to the fire and glory. Well, we've had the fire. Now it's time for the glory. What does the glory do? It opens your eyes. It causes you to fear God on a level you've never feared him before. I want you to know that in a moment, healings are going to appear. People's bodies are going to be loosened from crutches, canes, and wheelchairs by the power of Christ. God is going to do it, not man. But for now, I want you to tell Jesus you want more of him. I want you to tell him that you're not afraid of what he might do right now. You know, I've been in meetings 
where I was literally terrified at what that God might appear because the presence of God was so strong that I thought to myself, any moment an angel is going to show up and or Jesus is going to appear. But right now, I want you to reach out to God. Pray in the language of the Holy Spirit. Those of you watching on television, if you have received Christ, if you've received the Lord, you also have prayed that prayer. Believe me, there is a wonderful, wonderful new life waiting for you. And if you're a believer and you're watching, take this moment and join us in reaching out to God. Raise your voice, everyone, please. We all go all they can't see. Rite Sandere di Oroco Get up and walk. If the Holy Spirit tells you to do it, get up and walk in the name of Jesus. Get up and walk in the name of Jesus. The Bible says that he instantly received strength in his feet and was healed and began to walk. It happened, didn't it? It happened. You can walk now. This lady has received strength in her legs. Look at this. Somebody better give God the glory. Brother, it's happening to you. This is when tumors begin to fall off. I can't call anything out because too many people are being healed right now. I can't. I can't keep up. Look at your leg has been restored. This is a holy moment. This is a holy moment. You're healed, dear. Get out into the aisle. You're healed by the power of God. Don't wait. I think everybody better stand up right now and give the Lord a shout. We need a shout for the glory of God. There are five of you that have heart disease in this center section. I want to describe you. One is heart disease plus diabetes. Another is pain in the spine plus heart disease. A third is ear condition plus heart disease. Now there are five of you and I need you to obey God and put your hand in the air and receive your miracle right now. There's one, two, three, four, five. One, two, three, four, five. Oh, it's flowing. Mighty, it's flowing like a mighty river. Well, don't worry about the lights going out. We're having a time in the spirit. I think what's happening is the presence of God is making the circuits overload. Come on now, there's healing going on. There are seven people battling diabetes. Look at me. There's seven of you battling diabetes in this section right here, and you need God to heal you. Three of you, diabetes plus nerve damage in your feet. I want all seven of you to put your hand in the air. Do it now. One, two, three.
three, four, five, six. Where's seven? I'm going to get you. Seven. Leave your hand up right now. Be healed in the name of Jesus. Somebody get excited right now. I bind Satan in the name of Jesus. There are three that have cancer over on this side. Three of you that have cancer. Put your hand in the air. Don't be afraid. One, two, three. Wait a second. Leave your hand up. My dear in the navy blue. I need to call you out of this audience. I need you to come stand here right now. Don't be afraid. Come right now. We'll get the light situation fixed. Like I'm thinking, there's just such a presence of God. Don't be afraid of the camera. All that means is, is that people are going to get saved. Your healing is going to bring salvation to souls. Put your hand right there. The fire of God's going to burn this out of you. And I want to tell you why. You have a ministry. You're in the ministry. And you have been praying for other people to be healed. When you started praying for others to be healed, the devil attacked your body to stop you. I want you to tell me right now, are you going to stop praying for the sick? No. Wait a second. I, never, never. Five places in your body you're being healed by the power of God, right? I'm telling you, there is such an anointing. I need some help right now because this is too big for me. We give you the glory. We give you the glory. We give you the glory. Those tumors are vanishing in the name of Jesus. Somebody better give God the glory. You better give God the glory. You say, Mario, how do you even know if this is real? I mean, you know what? There is so much reality to what I'm saying is this. There are 10 of you in the center section that have migraine headaches. And all 10 of you can be healed instantaneously by Christ. Put your hand in the air, all 10 of you. One, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight, nine, and 10. I'm gonna, I'm gonna run around this tent right now. Put your hand on your forehead and watch the pain in your body go away and not come back, not by the word of man, but by the word of Christ. All the way in the back, look at me. You've got a right hand up and you're wearing white. Can you see me? Wave your hand at me if you see me. Yeah, that's you. You just went like that. I need more. Do you know that the pain in your head is not all that's wrong with you? You're going to be a sign and a wonder to everyone in this room right now. God is healing your neck. Did she fall under the power? Right now, look at me. Put both hands in the air. Your neck is being healed. Your legs are being healed. Your back is being healed. Your jaw is being healed. Let everybody know, Mario, you, what you're telling me is the truth. That's right. Wave your hand at me right now. It's the truth what you're saying. Look at her. We are not making this up. It is the glory of God in the... Somebody reach out. Get, get what you need from God. Get what you need from the Son of God. I'm pacing because I need relief. 
My brother, you just clapped and you're waving your hand at me right now. You know why? Your legs and your back are being healed by the power of God. Wave your hand at me right now. That's my spine and my legs that are being healed right now. What do I got to do, folks? What do I got to do? It's absolutely glorious joy, peace, power. You're wearing a tan coat, blonde hair here. Your hands are up. This is the end of this misery right now. I want you to believe God with me that you are being healed in the name of Jesus. And let me tell you something, dear. There's somebody else you want to get healed too. I get it, but I want you to receive yours first. Now I want you to look at me. Put your hand right there. Now put your hand right here. Now put your, your hand on your left leg. Your legs, your arms, your lungs, your eyes, your back, your, your body from head to toe is being healed in the name of Jesus. There it is. I don't know if I can take anymore. Can he walk? Can you walk? All right. Help him, help him in the name of Jesus. Lord, listen, let the Lord heal you where you're standing. You don't need to walk up here to be healed. You can be healed right where you are. And in the name of Jesus, let's reach out right now. Stomach ulcer right there. You know, you remember what your parents used to say? Don't make me come back there. When they're driving in the car, don't make me get off this stage and come get you. You have an ulcerated stomach. You're right down there. Put your hand on your stomach and you will be healed in Jesus' name. Wave your other hand at me so I can know who you are. I want you to know that there are four ulcerated stomachs that have all been situated in the same spot and they're being healed in Jesus' name. I got to have some help here. Don't give me the praise. Give him the praise. Give him the praise. I'm going to ask the worship team to come up here because I feel like, I feel like we're going to explode. I feel like that there's something in you that wants to praise God right now. How many of you know what I'm talking about? We need to do something. You know, the sad part is, is that I'm on the stage and it's hard to hear the words that they're singing. But there was one song they sang and it just tore you up. Man, it went, it went through you like butter on a hot flour tortilla. And uh, we got to sing it. What is the song we're talking about? Fast. It was one I asked you to come up here and sing something the first time. Yeah, you know what? What's it called? So I know. Everybody, put your hand over your heart. Say, I am the devil's worst nightmare. And we're going to get California back. We're not giving up on California. We're not going to let the devil have California. So in order for us to get this state back, God has to do a new thing. Let me tell you what, God's going to have a new kind of church. A church that worships God for the right reason. Church that is filled with the presence of God. You, pastor, can lead that church. Don't be afraid. Don't follow other people's model. Listen to God. We're an army. We're an army. At the end of this song, I can't promise you that I'll still be here. I might be flying in the air. I don't know. But I know that we're supposed to sing and we're supposed to roar and we're supposed to have 
an absolute miracle from the hand of God. Let's go. never in my life 
watched a religious devil die so hard as this one. You stomped the life out of that religious devil. How many of you believe God is doing a new thing? You believe he's doing a new thing? You know what I believe? I think we need a little more of that song right now. I think we need a little more. Come on. Hallelujah. You know, I'm not going to let you sit down. You know, right now, this is when the preacher says, you may be seated, you may not. Because you know what? Your foot is on the devil's neck right now. That's where it is. We have the triumph and the victory. And how many of you believe the joy and the power that's coming out of this meeting is going to carry into the churches? This next Sunday in your church is going to be the greatest explosion of the moving of the Spirit. Oh, wherever your church is, look out. We say, Mara, my church doesn't like this. Bring it. Bring the fire. Bring the fire. If you act like this in front of your pastor, he's going to preach himself crazy. He will break a sweat and preach himself crazy. How many of you are excited? Have these been the best four nights? Have these been amazing nights? Amazing nights. Mara, I feel so good, I gotta do something. Well, you need to buy a book. The book is entitled, Do Not Leave Quietly. How's that for a perfect title for tonight? You're going to leave. Do not leave quietly. And you can get it. It's normally $20. Tonight is $15. do not leave without it. I want to tell you how much Michelle and I have loved being with you. We have had the best time. The devil has had the worst time. We have had souls saved. We have a, a, a young man right here, young boy right here that was saved tonight, born again tonight, came back up to make noise. Came back up, said, I got saved, but that's not enough. I'm going to go up there 
with the rowdy worshipers. I'm going to get in it. Oh, another generation. Hallelujah. I wonder if I could ask Frank Saldana to come to the stage. I want you to clap for inner city action. And Frank, what a job. What a job they've done. What a job they've done. And my, I'm going to tell you, sometimes you need to read the history of George S. Patton. When Bastogne was surrounded by the Germans up in the mountains, in the ice and in the snow, and his men had been in a three-day battle, had no sleep and no food, and at his command turned around and marched a hundred miles. And then when they arrived, fought and defeated the Nazis and liberated Easy Company in Bastogne. Now, let me tell you something. That's exactly what this man is doing. That's why we need help folding chairs. He's gonna tell you a little bit more about it, but I need everyone to get ready to grab a chair and we'll tell you where to put it. And, but get ready, don't do it yet. We are going to Fort Myers, Florida, where the city has been devastated by Hurricane Ian. And Lance Walnow and I are starting a national tour called Fire and Glory. And the devil doesn't like it. You know, God puts teams together and it's like shake and bake. It's like nitro and glycerin. And there's a dynamism in our teamwork. And we are going to continue these living proof crusades across California. It's going to be amazing. Amazing. Now, Frank will come and explain to you how we're going to handle the, the chairs. And I want you to listen to him very carefully. Give him a great big hand as he comes. First, I want to thank all the volunteers. We This could not happen without you. So let's give just a hand up. Thank you so much for the workers. We could not do this without you. Those who came and helped set up the tent, uh, helped us every single day. Uh, you were here early. You're here late. We want to thank you so much for your help. And hope we'll see a lot of you guys in Fort 